The Church of Christ we have today, a blessing from the Lord. He gave her to His Son to say, and take her home above. The Timely deliverance, something in this life. 
And I never forgot that that we ended up being a very good uh, rule of thumb, a very good measure to go and look and interpret the scriptures. Uh, I want us to look a little bit this morning at something that's kind of uh, foundational to that, to about time salvation and eternal salvation, and want us to look at uh, something, uh, I, might, I might be introducing a couple of words you may not have heard before, but I, I found these useful, and the scriptures tell us that we should be prepared and, and ready to give reason for the hope that is in us. So I always want to be able to give uh, things to God's people from his word and in ways of explaining so that when we're talking to others, we can explain what we mean. Uh, why we have this hope that we do, what we mean by salvation in different aspects, and what we mean by these things. Uh, I have found that sometimes one of the hardest things to do when talking to others, and, and let's face it, for by and large, uh, we live in, in, in Christian communities. I mean, there will be wicked around us, but we have friends and family that, while they may not uh, attend the same church we do, they attend church somewhere, and they name the name of the Lord and are going to live, try to live godly lives. And and the thing is, though, they have a different understanding of the scriptures. Uh, that is, and, and they use the words differently sometimes. And you have to get through those barriers just to even discuss the word of God with them. I remember we find that that's been that that's even described in the scriptures once. Once Christ was speaking with a lawyer, and he says, what's written in the law, how readest thou? You know, it's not a question of what's written, particularly if everybody can agree to use the same translation of the Bible, which usually if I'm going to be discussing Scripture with someone, I insist that we use the King James Version so we'll have a common foundation to discuss from. But uh, there with Christ and this lawyer, he says, what's written in the law? In other words, the letter of the law, what was written there in the law of the prophets, there was no question about what was written there. Then he said, how readest thou? In other words, what do you think it means? How do you understand it? And that's the same uh, issues we have today. Uh, we can have, we speaking with uh, uh, dear loved ones about what the scriptures say, but, uh, and we can read the very words, but in their minds, they already have a, a notion of what it means to them, of what they've been taught that that means. And you have to break through those barriers to get down to the truth of what God's word actually says and how it should actually be applied. And one of the things that we have to do is get down to the understanding that God is sovereign, uh, that he has done whatsoever things in heaven that he, he is pleased, that, uh, that he is not uh, awaiting our cooperation in the eternal salvation of sinners. And we have to get down to the facts and teach the fact that the scriptures teach that there's many things that says are of the Lord, or of one, or by one. Uh, you can look in uh, Jonah, Jonah chapter uh, 2, verse 9. You find there at the end of verse 9, uh, we find that the just before the Lord uh, speaks to the fish, and that fish that had swallowed him up after he had been cast into the sea, uh, uh, threw him back up on the dry land to finish doing what the Lord had sent him to do, which was go preach in Nineveh, Jonah says a tremendous statement, a definitive statement concerning salvation. He says, salvation is of the Lord. And of course, that is a foundational statement of, of particularly when we're talking about eternal salvation, it says of the Lord. In other words, it is something that has been done by the Lord alone, or it's by one. And when we say that something is by one, or of one, or is the work of one, there's a word for that. It's called monergism. It means the work of one, or something that's of one. And when we talk about eternal salvation, we are talking about something that is a work of one, which is God. And so we, see, we would say it is monergistic. It was a work of one. Now that word can be applied to things other than salvation. Any time we want to say that something is of one, we can use that word. It's just a term. It's a word. It, it's one of those words that I, I'm increasingly finding that we can use to cut through all the chaff of, of, of misapplied terms that are used in the world around us. Because I can say I believe in salvation by grace, 
And my neighbor, who, who in fact believes in salvation by work, says they believe in salvation by grace. And so you've got to get everybody talking the same thing. And they're not talking the same thing. The religious world today, uh, particularly the Christian world today, is, is, is like a tower of Babel of terminology and words that are misapplied. And one man saying one thing and one man saying another thing. They don't mean the same thing at all. It's almost like American English and, and British English. Uh, we, if, if, we, if we said, uh, 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 you know, you, you, you're going to get a torch, so well, to British, that means a flashlight. You know, they're, they're talking about different words to mean different things, or sometimes the same thing. It's the same thing in the religious world today. So you can say, I believe in salvation by grace, and I have had... Uh, 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 friends and family that uh, uh, in fact believe in Arminian doctrine, in the doctrine of works, who said amen, they, they believe in salvation by grace too. And it took hours of conversation to get down to the fact that we're not talking about the same thing. So that's why I'm bringing this up about the use of some words to try to help uh, uh, get us to the point of the matter when we're discussing these things with people. So if we say something is of one or the work of one, we're saying it's monergistic. Okay? And I will admit right now, if you go and look in the religious world, you'll find people even use that word wrong. There's no way we get away from it completely, but we can certainly make an attempt. And so I'd like us to look at some things that are of one. Things that are of one. Now, if we're, if we're saying some things are one, there's things that are of more than one. And there's a word for that too. It's called synergism. And that's not what we're going to mainly look at this morning. But we're going to look at things, the things that are of one. But if something is of more than one, in other words, if you're saying that something is of the Lord and of you, well, that's two. And in some cases, someone may say, well, it's the work of, of the Lord and of you and a preacher. Well, that's three. And you can even get more than that. But that's synergism. In other words, it's of more than one. But I'd like to just look at some things that are of one. We started off with salvation is of the Lord. That's of one. What's interesting is the entire situation that man finds himself in today, that fall in the garden, that's that which set the whole framework, the whole picture of fallen man, of the entire need of salvation, was also of one. That comes to question Oftentimes, where did sin come from? How did sin enter into the world? Uh, some forms of religion would try to attribute that to God himself, which is wrong. While we can affirm that it was of one, it wasn't of God. If we look in Romans in chapter 5, in verse 19, it says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. We find here that it's talking about the one man's disobedience. That was Adam. That was Adam. That was him there in the garden. By him transgressing the law of God, the one law of God that was given, many were made sinners. In other words, all those that were in Adam, which is all of us, everybody that came afterwards, what came out of Adam. And he, that he included Eve as well. Remember, she was taken from Adam. So it all came down to him, and in a sense, and in, in, in truth, it was, that was a modernist thing. It was of one. It says it right here. It says, for by one man's disobedience, men were made sinners. And so the need of salvation is because of that. That's why we say we believe in total depravity. We believe in original sin. Even though we are also sinners by practice, we come to this world sinners by nature. We don't all experience an individual fall from grace as some would teach. We don't come into the world neutral and, uh, and either go one way or the other. That's not the way it works. This was because of Adam, by one. Now that sets the foundation for uh, uh, many other doctrines, including that of headship, the federal headship. We find that Adam, we were represented by Adam. That's how we can understand that we fell in Adam because he represented the entirety of humanity there in what he did. <laughs> Therefore, all that came after him suffered the same results and inherit that same fallen nature. For by one man. But notice what it says after that. It says, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. 
Well, that's Jesus Christ. Now, there's other places. I won't read all the scriptures associated with it, but he is referred to as the second man, the second Adam. And he is now on our head. Now, as he has, uh, been, as many, his children, his elect, have been given unto him before the foundation of the world. You can look in Ephesians 1 and 4 and see how we were given in adoption under Christ Jesus. You can look in John 17 and 2 and see that he gave, he gave eternal life to as many as the Father had given him. That we find he represents them. That we have been taken away from that old family and have been adopted into a new family. We had that old headship of Adam of one and now we have the new headship of one even Jesus Christ. And as that one work that was done by Adam caused us to be sinners, we find that one work of one even Jesus Christ has made us alive, has made us righteous, has justified us before God. That's also the work of one, even Jesus Christ. Now notice here, it's very important. It says, Followed by the obedience. Sometimes people say, well, obedience is never part of eternal salvation. Yes, it was. But the obedience of one, not ours, that be two, it was of Jesus Christ. If it, it takes our obedience plus his obedience, that then becomes synergism because that's of two, the work of two. But it says here, it was by the righteous, we have been made righteous. Notice it's not an offer to become righteous. We were made righteous, it says, by the obedience of one. When did that obedience occur? Ultimately, we see it was there on the cross. The scripture says there's going to be but one sacrifice forever. Christ is a sacrifice many times. It's not only one man, one, who, one man even Jesus Christ, who, made, who was obedient, but there's only but one sacrifice. We'll look at that here in a bit. So we see here the concept, the idea of things being of one, or the work of one. We have the work of Adam, which was of one, which many were made sinners, and the work of one, the many, shall many be made righteous, which is Jesus Christ. That's monarchy, the work of one. So when we talk about eternal salvation, we can understand inherently then that it is also speaking of the work of one. And that's what many people don't understand today. They look at eternal salvation and since they don't divide eternal salvation from timely salvation, then they also don't de determine that the, uh, uh, the work of one in that it's a work of one in eternal salvation. They don't see that. They see it as a cooperative or a synergistic work. Now, if we go to the Gospel of John in chapter 1, And verse 13, here in John chapter 1, it talks about Christ being, in, uh, being the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. It talks about His incarnation, Him coming unto His own, in other words, He's born there unto the house of, of Judah there, and, and of the descendant of Abraham. And that as He came unto His own, not all received Him. You know, not all, everyone there in, in, in Judah and Israel welcomed Christ, though He was the Messiah. But then it starts talking about the reason why there were some who did. Why was it that some did? Why is it that anybody would ever welcome Christ? Why is it they would ever uh, be blessed to see that he is who he said he was? That he that he's the Messiah, and that he has loved them, and he has done this wonderful work for them. Something's had to have happened to them to enable them to see that. We know that's true when we go and look in Matt. I think it's Matthew uh, 16 where Christ said, "Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am?" And he says, and Peter finally stands up after people have said all sorts of things. And the disciple says, "Well, some say you're Isaiah or Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets or something." And uh, uh, Peter stands up and says, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God." What did Christ attribute Peter's understanding that to? He says, flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which in heaven hath revealed it unto thee. Brethren, to be able to see Christ for who he is, it requires the blessing of God. It requires a particular blessing. And we go here in verse 13, we find uh, the, the source of this blessing. If we go in uh, 1 John 1 and verse 13, it says, these the people who welcome him, who see him for what he is, Christ that is, it says, which were born. It talks about being born. It's talking about the new birth here. Being born again. It says, which were born. And then it makes some statements concerning where this birth does not come from. 
The scriptures do that very often. It'll say how something does happen. It'll also say how something does not happen. So he says, which were born, that's the fact. Now, it says, but not of blood. In other words, it's not uh, 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 who you're descended from. It couldn't be of blood. You know, the, many of the Jews uh, uh, hung their hat on and had hope in that they were children of God because they were the descendants of Abraham. Since Abraham was said in the scriptures to be the friend of God, if they're descended from Abraham, well, they're the friends of God. Therefore, they're children of God. Well, but it says here it's not of blood. Because Abraham wasn't the first man. Was it? He's generations down the line from the first man. And all men go by blood back to that first man. Uh, matter of fact, uh, being uh, born again, being born of God, can't be of blood because being born of the, that which is of blood is death, actually. Because all died in Adam. Because we're descended from him. It says, not of blood. And then it says, it's nor the will of the flesh. Nor the will of the flesh. Scriptures make it very clear that there's nothing about the natural man that is inclined to do anything concerning God. You can go into Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. You can go into other places and see what that natural man is like, what that flesh is like, that which is born of flesh. Uh, it, it says it doesn't understand God, it doesn't seek God. The scriptures describe that if you look, were able to look there in John chapter, I mean Romans chapter 3, that if you was able to look inside the natural man, you'd see nothing but death. Uh, it's not of the will of the flesh. Uh, you can go into 1 Corinthians in uh, chapter 2 it is, and it talks about the carnal, the carnal flesh only knows the things of the flesh by the spirit of man that dwelleth in him. It's kind of a paraphrase, but that's what it's talking about. That we cannot understand any things of, the, of God except by the spirit of God. It says, it's, we find here, it says, it's nor of the will of the flesh. The natural man just does not seek the things of God. It says, nor the will of man. In other words, nothing about his intellect, nothing about that which he could choose. Oftentimes, in what the, 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 the a way that so many say that uh, eternal salvation is achieved is that it's offered out there and that it's yours if you'll take it. If you'll exercise your will, your volition, that you have to make that choice to be eternally saved. Well, the scriptures deny that. It says it's nor the will of man. There is nothing in the natural man that has a will to do that. As a matter of fact, his will is quite the opposite. He, the scripture says he's enmity against God. The natural man, mind is enmity against God. It's not of the will of man. He doesn't have any. Well, he doesn't have that will. And you know that's something else that's important to explain to folks. People misunderstand us when we say that the natural man doesn't have a will to do that, and they'll say, "Well, uh, don't you believe uh, he has a will?" Yes, the natural man has a will, and I would even say the natural man has a free will within the bounds of the nature that he has. He's able freely to do anything that he can do by the spirit of man. But the spirit of man does not seek the things of God. It does not cross that boundary. It cannot cross that boundary. It has no desire to. It has no understanding to. It has no experience to. That's why it takes having a new nature. One that's given by God to have a will that's to the things of God. And then finally, it gets down to the end, but of God. So you could take out the negative things there if you wanted you to understand this verse and the things that it's not of. And if you wanted to see what it is of, it simply says, which were born of God. <laughs> In other words, of one. That new birth happens because of the work. It's a work of one, which is God. We are caused to become alive. We are made a new creature in Christ by the work of God. You know, people say, well, uh, how does that happen? Well, the scripture says, you know, we find the entire Godhead involved in that. Christ said that no man cometh unto me except my Father draw him. And we find that the scriptures talk about us being born of the Spirit of God, regenerated by the washing of the Holy Ghost. And then it also talks about us being made alive by the voice and the power of the Son of God in John 25, 5 and 24. So we find the Godhead, all of them involved there. It's the work of one, which is God. <laughs> 
Whether we're talking about the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost, it doesn't matter. It's the work of one. Now, we can go to some other places and look at things that are of one. If you go into 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we find uh, some statements that are made concerning there being one. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, not chapter 9, chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and you can go into verse 6. And, and, and we find here that uh, the Apostle Paul is, uh, the background there is the Apostle Paul is talking about how uh, they had come out, the Corinthians had come out of pagan background, and they called all, all sorts of idols and things gods that weren't God. So he says in verse 6 of chapter 8, he says, But to us there is but one God. One God. That's fundamental. You go back into the Old Testament, it says, Hear ye, O house of Israel, your Lord is one Lord. And, and sometimes people say, But don't you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Yes, we do. But the Scripture says, For these three are one. You know, it's not three gods, there's just one God. You're expressed in three persons, but there's only one God. He says, but there is unto us one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. Notice it attributes our being in him. And, I, and when we say we're in him, other places you see about being in Christ, that's a positional statement. That's, a st that's, that's, how, that's whose household and whose family you're accounted a member of. We're in him. It says, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, and we by him. So it talks about us being in God, the Father. It talks about us being uh, Christ, who has made all things, and we by him. And both of those are monarchism. It's, but either way you look at that, it's of one. We are in God by his will. We are in Christ and, and ultimately in God because of the work of Jesus Christ. He says, by whom are all things. Remember that Christ was the incar is the incarnation of the second member of the Godhead. It says he's the Word. In John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made by him, and there was nothing made that was made without him. I messed that up a little bit then, but you get my point. That when in the beginning, you can go back to Genesis, where it says, that said, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be this and that, and all the different things that happened in creation. That was done by the second member of the Godhead. That was his function. That was his role. That he spoke these things into existence. And brethren, when these things are spoken into existence, it also includes our new birth. Our life in Christ. You go into John chapter 5 and verses, 25, and verses 24 on down through. It talks about uh, Christ being the one who speaks life into us. It also says that by his voice, when he speaks, he's going to raise the dead from the grave and make those bodies alive again, again and, and, and glorify. So it says, one, there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and, the Lord, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. It's not by him plus something additional. Our works, our obedience, our belief. No, it's by one, by him. Now, if we go on, we can see here it's, it, it emphasizes, but there is what one God. If we go now into uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, chapter 2, 1 Timothy, Chapter 2. In verse 5, it says, For again, for there is one God. And it says, And one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus. One mediator. There's but one God, and there's but one mediator. Now, one thing we need to understand about mediation what is, what is a mediator doing? He is the one who stands between. He is the one who makes things right between the two parties. We've often heard about something instead of going to trial, going to mediation. You know, that's a good thing to remember. Is that, you know, if, if you go to mediation, you don't have to go to trial and judgment. Well, brethren, because we have a mediator and we've been taken to mediation, we don't go to judgment. We don't go to trial and judgment. 
Because we have a mediator, and that's Christ Jesus. He is the one who is standing there before God. He is the one that no matter what accusation is brought by the devil concerning us, it, he says, no, my blood has paid the price. I have made them just. And you know, Christ sees us entirely through the work of his son. He sees us differently. You know, we, we know that we are still sinners here. We've been changed into inward parts, but in the outer man, we still have a sin that works in our members and in our minds. Uh, but, but brethren, that is not how we are treated by God because his son has already paid the price and he is suitable to be the mediator for us before God. And that price is always good. That ransom he made. Matter of fact, the next verse it says, in verse 6 it says, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. For all of his God's children, he imposed the ransom. And so no matter what happens, that ransom price has been paid. He has redeemed us by his blood, as it says in other places. But notice, it's by one. We have one mediator. Now, if we had to go before God and had to bring our own works before God, and that was how we were going to be saved, eternally speaking, that is, then there would be more than one mediator. Brethren, even if we had to simply go and exercise an act of faith, or we had to say a prayer, or believe, or do anything, we would be bringing that before God, and in bringing that before God, we would be acting as our own mediator. But the Scriptures insist there's but one mediator, and it's the same one who paid the ransom price, which is Jesus Christ. One mediator. If we go and look in some other places, there's more things concerning these things being of one. If we go into the Hebrew letter in chapter 10, Hebrews in chapter 10, and we'll begin about verse 9. Hebrews 10 and 9. And if you've never studied through the book of Hebrews, never read through the book of Hebrews, I strongly encourage it as I would any of the Bible, but there are so many deep points that are made here. And it's not an easy book, by the way. The book of Hebrews is not an easy book. I remember early on when, uh, when I was becoming far more interested in studying the things of God and understanding the things of grace. And I, the first time I really seriously tried to read through the book of Hebrews to gain understanding and to understand how that applied to salvation by grace. I came at the end of it completely, you know, not understanding. It just, I didn't get it, <laughs> so much of it. So I prayed to God that he would give me an understanding of this book. And, and over time, he has shown me a few things. I don't claim to say I know everything there is to know, but uh, it's a few, the few things the Lord is, is, has, has opened up it, I find are beautiful and, and very deep and, and things that, are, that uh, really enhance our understanding. It says here in chapter 10, verse 9, it says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. So this is speaking of God the Word, the Son, Jesus Christ. He has come to do the will of the Father. And you know that's consistent with the testimony that Christ gave in the New Testament. He says, all the things that I do, all the things I've said were given unto me by my Father. I've not done anything that was outside of what was given to me by my Father. It then says, he taketh away the first that he might establish the second. And this is talking about the covenants. You had the law covenant, which was a covenant of works. It was. Now, they were not ever eternally saved by a covenant of works. It was a type. It was given as a law, a covenant of obedience to the nation of Israel, and that if they stayed in that nation of Israel, they would experience blessings as God's people as that nation, as a people. But it was a type of spiritual Israel. The truth is, though, what they find under the old covenant is that none can keep it. No one can keep the law of God perfectly. Even the law giver and the high priest of the law. Yeah, Moses and Aaron, as Brother Randy mentioned earlier, they did not. Moses didn't enter into Canaan's land because he broke that law. We find here, you say, well, what law did Moses break? He set up an idol. 
worse. It wasn't a golden calf like Aaron had. It was himself. Must I fetch water from this stone? Is what he said. And in that he did not magnify the Lord God before the house of Israel. So, he broke one of the very commandments that the Lord gave him to deliver down Mount Sinai. So it says, here, Christ said, I come to do thy will, O God. It says, he taketh away the first, that he might establish the second. That we find that Christ was the one who fulfilled all of the law, to the jot, to the tittle, in other words, in every point possible, never sinned, was the spotless Lamb of God, and he established a new covenant because the old one had been fulfilled. Once an old co once a covenant's finally been fulfilled, the new one can be established. It had to be fulfilled for the second to be established, and that's what he did. It says in verse 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Again, for all of spiritual Israel, all the elect, that we find they are sanctified by this one offering. The offering of Jesus Christ upon the cross, of his blood, of his death, him dying in our stead. It, and it had to be by death. We say that he, he, we were saved by his blood. Yes, but understand that implies by his death. It couldn't have been that blood was shed and he didn't die. There's actually heresy out there in the world that teaches that. No, he had to die because the wages of sin is death. So he had to die in our stead. And he says here in verse 11, it says that every priest standeth by daily ministering and offerings oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. You know, they did it time and time again. Day after day, year after year, they offered these sacrifices. There it is. They never actually took away sin. Not before God. They didn't, you know, they, that's not what they did. It says, but this man, which is Jesus Christ, it says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. So here we see it is one sacrifice. Again, something that's a one. In this case, it's a one sacrifice. It had the result of taking away sins forever. You can go back in Job. And the hope that Job had was that his sins would be taken away, be sewn up in a bag, and remembered no more. It says in the scriptures that our sins are taken away as far as the east is from the west, that our sins are remembered no more. The old Israel even had uh, something that they did that taught them this lesson, that taught them that this would be the way it would be, in that they had two things that they did. You had the the, the, the lamb that was given there, or ram that was given there on the high day of sacrifice for a high day of atonement. And at the, on that same, at that same day that you find that they had a goat. So you had a sacrifice made for the house of Israel there. And then you had a goat. And the purpose of the goat, it wasn't sacrificed. But the whole high priest, he laid his hand upon the head of it. And then it was taken by a strong man out in the wilderness to be remembered no more because it carried away the sin. Or typified carrying away the sin. So you see, we find the work of Jesus Christ there by one, sin being taken away, to be remembered no more. It says, again, it says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, it says, sat down at the right hand of God. That means he was done. When Jesus Christ said, it is finished, he really meant it. That's one of the things I, I emphasize to uh, friends and and, and loved ones, when I'm talking about the work of Jesus Christ, when we say we believe in salvation by grace, brethren, I, I tell them that it's by the work of one, Jesus Christ, and that when he said it is finished, it was, didn't just mean his sufferings. It meant the work that the Father had given him to do was finished. And it was proven and demonstrated that it was finished three days and three nights later when Christ arose from that grave. Because it says he was raised for our justification. Now, we, we were justified on the cross. In other words, his rising from the, the grave proved, demonstrated that the work that he had done before the Father was sufficient, that it was complete, that he had done what he had set out to do, what the Father had sent him to do, which was to deliver his people from their sins. As it says in, John, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
33 years later, he did it, and it was accomplished, and he rose from the grave, brethren. And it was a work of one. It says he sat down on the right hand of God. It says in verse 13, from henceforth, from, in other words, from that moment on, it says expect him till his enemies be made his footstool. In other words, the work is finished. All that is going on right now, we have the church age, we have our lives being lived out, we have us uh, trying to serve God and to understand the things of God, but the work of Jesus Christ is finished, the covenant is sealed, it is complete, uh, those sins have been taken away, and he, when it says he's sitting there expecting until his enemies be made his footstool, in other words, he's waiting for all the enemies to roll out, in other words, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. But the work was done then. It's not being done now. It's not waiting yet to be done. All that's waiting to be done is for the Father to say to him, Arise, go get my people. That's all we're waiting on. It says in verse 14, it says, For by one offering, again, something that's by one, for by one offering, and what does he say the result is here? He says, he, being Jesus Christ, hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Before God, we have been made, we've been perfected. We've been perfected. Now, you, we look at ourselves and say, well, I don't feel very perfect. That's not what it's talking about here. It's not talking about in our lives that we're having to struggle here with the flesh here. Before God, legally, positionally, uh, and in justification, we have been made perfect before the Father by the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There are not more sacrifices. There are not masses that need to be taken place to go on to apply more sacrifices unto God's people. And God's people are certainly not asked to sacrifice to achieve this thing here. Now the scriptures talk about us offering sacrifices unto God, but these are only things that are in obedience. The sacrifices of the lips of thanksgiving, uh, of things that we do by the offerings of our bodies is our, uh, uh, the things that we would do to serve God. But this is talking about that which makes us perfect. This is the work of Jesus Christ, and that is one offering. It can't be added to, it can't be subtracted to, from, and it's given for those that, that he has perfected. Now, sometimes people say, well, what about this sacrifice? Wasn't it made for all men? No, that's not what it says here. It says here, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Brethren, if that sacrifice, that atonement had been made for all men, then all men would be perfect. The scriptures would declare that. But that's not what it says. We know that hell is real. We know that not all are children of God. Not all are chosen by God. You can go and look into numerous scriptures where it talks about the elect. The scriptures would not talk about the elect if the fact was that everybody was uh, perfected in this way. You know, I, I get off on a tangent sometimes about the nature of the atonement, but this verse here, verse 14, makes it very clear. There's only two possibilities, logical, rational possibilities, when it comes to the atonement. Either he is perfected forever by one sacrifice, the elect, those whom he has chosen, which is not all of the human race, or he is perfected and sanctified everybody, which is universal. It can't be a middle ground, scripturally. And the reason universalism isn't, isn't true because Christ himself taught the reality of hell that not all are his people. He said there are sheep and there are goats. <laughs> and he says of the goats uh, uh, that they are not his sheep. He told, me, some, he told some of the uh, Pharisees that ye are not my sheep. He says you're not. Some are, some aren't. That eliminates the possibility of universalism, which leaves only one rational possibility taught from the scriptures, and that is the limited atonement of Jesus Christ, the particular redemption of his people by this one offering, and by which he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, I'd like to go to one other place. One other place here. Go back just a little bit. It speaks of them 
those whom he has sanctified. If you go back in Hebrews to chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And we'll begin in verse 10. We can even begin in verse 9. It says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That was the purpose for which he came into this world was to suffer death for his people. It says, A crown with glory and honor. Why is he crowned with glory and honor? The picture that is painted there of glory and honor, you could go back and look at things like uh, the Olympics or the races that they would run back then. If someone had completed and finished that race and won, they were crowned with glory and honor. Christ completed that which was done. If he had, he wouldn't be crowned with glory and honor. It says that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now we're going to go on and see in the next verses that it makes clear that he's speaking of his son when it says every man, every one of his children. It says in verse 10, it says, For it became him for whom are all things. And this is speaking of Christ. It says, For whom are all things. That gets back into the purpose of God. All the things are for Christ. And it says, and by whom are all things. Remember, he is the creator. In bringing many sons to glory. This is what he means by all men, many sons. And that's not every human being. It says, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. In other words, he perfectly accomplished the fulfillment of the covenant that God had given him to do through his sufferings. There upon the cross. That's why he was able to say, it is finished. It says in verse 11, it says, For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified, remember they were sanctified by that one offering, are all, again, of one. Of one. We have our being and existence in God. We have that we are his children because of Christ. It says here, who are, it says they are of one. Now, we're going to explain this a little bit. It says, for by which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So, who is the one, who's the he, and who are the brethren? Well, it's the many sons of the brethren. But understand here, it says we're of one, which is of God. And by implication here, we are saved eternally by God. And it says, bring many sons unto glory, and he has sanctified them, and they're all of one. And then it says, speaking of Christ, he is not ashamed to call them Brethren. Remember, Christ told the disciples, I and my Father are one. But Christ also prayed that his children would be one in them. We are one in Christ. And we are his brethren. It says we're the children of the Father and brethren of the Son. And it's a very interesting relationship we have there because it means we're all of one. The scripture says of Christ, he is of one, even God. And if we are also, in other words, if Christ is of God, and we are of God, then there's only one conclusion you have. We're brethren. We have one Father. Our heavenly Father. And we find here it's because we have been sanctified by our elder brother. The scripture says, if a man would have friends, he must show himself friendly, and there's one that sticketh closer than a brother. Well, that one is Jesus Christ. Because he has laid down his life for us and sanctified us and bought us back unto our Heavenly Father and stands there as our mediator, having made that one sacrifice. 
whereby he's perfected forever his children. When we talk about things being of one, when we talk about eternal salvation being of one, when we talk about it being monergistic, these are the things that we are talking about. We find that the scriptures don't say it is of God or of Christ plus us. It's of God. As Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. Think about that. Think about that. Think about those things when you go and explain to your loved ones, friends, and neighbors about the joys that you have in God, about how these things are of one. Even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's all I have this morning. Thank you for your kind attention. Of